Welcome, curious minds, to the deep dive. We're tackling uh, one of the really big quests in AI today, the search for genuine multi-step reasoning. Because, you know, while today's large language models are amazing, they generate text, do all sorts of tasks that really deep, complex, you know, step-by-step -step problem solving, that's still a major hurdle. And here on the deep dive, what we do is take your sources, could be articles, research papers, our own notes, and we pull out the key insights. Think of it as your shortcut to getting properly informed. Uh, hopefully with a few interesting bits along the way. So today, we are diving into something I think is really exciting, this new AI architecture. It's called the Hierarchical Reasoning Model, or HRM. And the really cool part, it actually takes its inspiration directly from the human brain. Yeah, our goal today is pretty straightforward. First, let's figure out why current AI, even the best LLMs, kind of struggle with that deep algorithmic reasoning. Then we'll unpack how this, uh, this brain-inspired model, HRM, really shifts the landscape. And finally, what does it all mean for the future of AI? It's, well, it's a look into how we might actually build models that can, you know, truly think. Okay, so deep reasoning. For a while now, the main technique people have been using with large language models is this thing called chain of thought prompting, AET. But, I mean, how far does that actually get us, especially when we're talking about this, like, really deep algorithmic stuff in LLMs? Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's the key question, really, because even with Coty, these current LLM architectures, they fundamentally hit a ceiling. There's a limit to the kind of problem they can solve efficiently. It's a bit like um, trying to run really complex planning software on a basic calculator. They just aren't set up for that kind of deep step-by-step, -step, almost symbolic work that true reasoning often needs. They aren't universal problem solvers in that sense. And chain of thought, I mean, it helps, but it really is more of a crutch, isn't it? It leans so heavily on these like predefined steps, often laid out by humans. And if just one step is wrong or out of order, well, the whole process can just fall apart. It's brittle. Right. Plus, because it relies on language steps, it often needs tons of training data, generates loads of tokens, which makes it slow. So, yeah, yeah not exactly efficient or robust for deep thinking. And you can really see those limits, can't you, when you yeah. throw specific hard problems at them? Like you mentioned Sudoku. Exactly. There's this data set, Sudoku Extreme, designed to be incredibly tough. Yep. Coty models, they completely fail. We're talking 0% accuracy. Hell. Yeah, it's a brick wall. Same thing happens with finding the optimal path in really large, complex mazes. Zero percent again for Coty. And what's really telling is even if you make the models much bigger, more depth, more width, doesn't help on these tasks. No performance gain at all. They just can't crack them fundamentally. Okay, so that sets the stage. The Coty isn't cutting it for these complex tasks. And you said HRM is a completely different paradigm. Inspired by the brain, that, that definitely got my attention. How does it use that brain idea to, well, tackle these problems? It's really fascinating how they drew the inspiration. So the human brain, it handles deep multi-stage thinking using hierarchy, right? Different brain regions working together, but on different time scales, you can think of like slow brain waves, theta waves, maybe handling the high level planning, the abstract stuff, and then faster waves, gamma waves, dealing with the quick detailed computations needed right now. Uh. And the brain manages this incredible depth of reasoning without the huge computational costs, like the credit assignment problems that really plague standard AI methods like backpropagation through time when they try to learn long sequences. So HRM sort of copies that structure. How does it work architecturally? Pretty much. It has two core parts, two recurrent modules that work together. There is a high-level module, they call it H, which handles the slow, abstract planning, your big picture thinker, if you will. Okay, the H module, slow and abstract. And then there's a low-level L module. This one's fast. It does the rapid, detailed computations, the quick executor. H and L, high and low. Got it. So what are the key tricks, the innovations that make this structure work so well? Right. There are a few key things. First is something called hierarchical convergence. This is really clever. It tackles a big problem in standard recurrent networks where they can sort of converge too early, get stuck. In HRM, the low-level module, the L1, runs for multiple steps on its own. It finds a kind of local solution or equilibrium. Ah, so the fast part works on a piece of the problem. Exactly. And only then does the high-level H module update. And when it updates, it essentially resets or guides the L module's path 
for the next chunk of computation. So it prevents the whole system from just settling too quickly. It keeps the computation going deeper. Precisely. It allows the model to effectively compute for way, way longer, potentially NT steps, where T is the limit for one module without the gradients vanishing or exploding, which is a classic problem. Figure three in the source material actually shows this visually quite well. Okay, that makes sense. It's like punctuated computation. What else is new? The second big one is a novel one-step gradient approximation. This is maybe the most technically significant part for efficiency. It lets HRM learn without needing backpropagation through time, BPTT. BPTT. That's one that needs loads of memory, right? Yeah. Because it has to store all the intermediate steps. Exactly. BPTT has a memory footprint that scales with the sequence length, OT. HRM's approximation avoids that. It only needs to consider the very last state of each module for the gradient calculation. Which, me which means it has an O1 memory footprint. Constant memory, regardless of how many steps it takes. Wow, okay. O1 memory. That's huge for actually building and running these things. And you said more biologically plausible, too. Well, yes, because the brain almost certainly doesn't do exact BPTT over long time scales. This approximation is much more efficient and potentially closer to how biological systems might handle credit assignment over time. It's a massive step for scalability. Okay, hierarchical convergence, one step gradient. Mm -hmm. What's the third innovation? Third is deep supervision. They built in a mechanism where the system doesn't just calculate the error, the loss, at the very end of the computation. It calculates loss and updates the parameters at multiple points or segments during its forward pass. And why do that? What's the benefit? It gives the high-level module more frequent feedback. It helps keep the whole learning process stable and on track, acting as a kind of regularization. It makes it learn better and more robustly. Frequent feedback regularization makes sense. Is there a fourth? Yes, the last key piece is adaptive computational time, or ACT. This is really cool because it's directly inspired by that thinking fast and slow idea from psychology, mm -hmm. you know, system one and system two. Oh yeah, Kahneman. The fast, intuitive gut feeling versus the slow, deliberate reasoning. So the AI learns how much effort to put in. Pretty much. HRM uses a reinforcement learning technique, specifically Q-learning, to dynamically figure out how many computational steps are actually needed for a given task or even a given input. So it doesn't just run for a fixed amount of time? Nope. If the problem seems easy, it might stop early, saving compute. If it's complex, it'll run for longer. And the sources show this works really well. Figure 5A and B demonstrate it saves a lot of computation with hardly any hit to performance. That's really efficient. And even better, it allows for something called inference time scaling. You can just tell the model at test time, hey, you have more time to think now, increase its computational limit, and its performance often gets better without any retraining. Just let it think harder on the spot. That's, right, right. that's very flexible. It really is. It adapts. Okay, so we've gone through how HRM works under the hood, yeah. the h &L modules, hierarchical convergence, that O1 memory trick, deep supervision, adaptive time. It sounds really sophisticated. You know, the proof is in the pudding. How did this translate into actual results on those tough problems you mentioned earlier? And efficiently. This is where it gets really impressive. HRM pulled off these results using only 27 million parameters. That's tiny compared to modern LLMs. 27 million. Seriously. Yep. And trained on just 1,000 examples per task. Crucially, with no large-scale pre-training and no specific chain of thought data. So small model, small data. Big results. Huge results on the specific benchmarks they designed to break other models. Take Sudoku Extreme, 9 by 9 These are puzzles designed to need a lot of backtracking search. HRM gets near-perfect accuracy. Near-perfect. And the Cunny models? Still 0%. Complete yeah. failure. It's a massive difference. Okay. What about the mazes? Same story for maze hard. 30 by 30 Finding the shortest path in these big, tricky mazes. HRM. Near-perfect accuracy again. Cunny models, 0%. It's just night and day on these algorithmic tasks. Absolutely. And then there's the ARC AGI challenge. This is a benchmark aimed at measuring more general problem solving closer to AGI. HRM scored 40.3% accuracy on one version, ARC AGI 1. That significantly beats much, much larger Coat T models like O3 mini highs, which got 34.5%, and even something like Claude 3.7, which only managed 21.2%, despite having way more parameters and context. Wow. 
So even on more general reasoning benchmarks, this smaller, specialized architecture is punching way above its weight against giant LLMs using CoT. Exactly. And they did compare it against a baseline transformer trained directly on the tasks, direct pred, also small sample. Adron was significantly better, showing that the hierarchical structure itself is providing a huge advantage for this kind of reasoning. Okay, the performance is clearly stellar. But did they get any insight into how HRM is solving these problems? Like, what's going on inside his brain? Yeah, they tried to peek inside, which is always fascinating. They looked at the intermediate predictions HRM makes as it's working through a problem. And it seems like it actually adapts its strategy. So for the maze tasks, the visualizations showed it exploring multiple potential paths, then kind of pruning the bad ones, refining the solution over time. Looks a bit like how a person might explore a maze. Okay, like a search. For Sudoku, it looked more like a depth-first search, potentially with backtracking, like it's making guesses and then correcting them if they lead to a contradiction. Makes sense for Sudoku. And for the ARC tasks, which are more abstract, it seemed to make lots of small incremental adjustments, iteratively improving its answers step by step. Figure 7 in the sources shows some of these different processes. So it's not just one fixed algorithm. It's learning different problem-solving approaches. It appears so. It suggests a more flexible, dynamic reasoning process than just following a fixed chain of thought. That is really cool. It's like it's figuring out how to think about different problems. And connecting this to the bigger picture, maybe the most profound finding is what they call the brain correspondence. HRM seems to spontaneously reproduce a really fundamental principle. <laughs> Dimensionality organization. What does that mean in this context? So there's this measure called the participation ratio, or PR. It's basically a way to quantify the effective dimensionality of the representations in a neural network layer. Think of it as how many different features or concepts is this part of the network juggling simultaneously. Higher PR means yeah. more complex representations, more flexible thinking. Exactly. A higher PR suggests the network is using a richer, more flexible representational space. And neuroscientists have found that in the brain, higher level cognitive areas, like parts of the cortex involved in planning, tend to operate in higher dimensional spaces than lower level sensory or motor areas. And HRM shows the same pattern. Strikingly so. The high-level H module in HRM operates in a much higher dimensional space. Its PR was measured around 90. The low-level L module operated at a much lower dimensionality, PR around 30. Wow. So H is high dimensional, L is lower, just like the brain hierarchy is thought to work. Precisely. The ratio between them, about 3 to 1 in HRM, is remarkably close to the ratio observed between different cortical areas in mice, which is around 2.25 to 1. That's quite a coincidence if it is one. Well, it gets better. They also found that the dimensionality of the H module actually increases as the variety of tasks the model is trained on increases, which, again, mirrors findings in biological brains, complexity scales with environmental demands. Figure 8 shows the scaling. Okay, this sounds significant, but could it just be baked into the architecture that having two modules forces this difference? That's what they checked. They ran a control analysis using an untrained HRM network. And guess what? No significant difference in dimensionality between the H and L modules. Ah, so it's not just the structure. It's something the model learns during training, an emergent property. Exactly. It learns to organize itself this way to solve the problems effectively. This is really important because many standard deep networks suffer from something called neural collapse, where representations become less diverse, lower dimensional during training. Right. Losing that flexibility. But HRM seems to avoid that. It maintains these high dimensional representations, especially in the H module, which is thought to be crucial for cognitive flexibility, the kind of thing we associate with higher order brain regions like the prefrontal cortex. So it's not just performing well, it's organizing its internal thoughts in a way that mirrors biological principles of effective reasoning. Which raises that big question, doesn't it? If HRM is autonomously discovering this kind of fundamental organizational principle, one that biology seems to use for robust, flexible thought, what does that really imply? It suggests HRM isn't just a collection of clever tricks. It might be tapping into something more fundamental about how to structure computation for deep reasoning, potentially getting closer to, you know, practical Turing completeness or universal problem solving ability than previous architectures. Okay, let's try and wrap this up. We've dived deep into the hierarchical reasoning model, HRM. It's this novel brain inspired AI architecture. It offers um, really substantial computational depth and efficiency. 
Breaking through limitations we see with methods like chain of thought in big language models, it tackles complexity differently. Exactly. And its ability to solve these really hard algorithmic problems, Sudoku, mazes, ARC, with such a small model, minimal data, no pre-training, that's pretty remarkable. It definitely pushes AI closer towards more general purpose reasoning systems. It really demonstrates that sometimes, you know, looking at nature's designs, that biological inspiration can lead to breakthroughs where just scaling up existing methods hits a wall. So as we finish this deep dive, here's something to chew on. HRM doesn't just solve hard problems. It seems to learn an internal organizational structure, this hierarchical dimensionality that mirrors the brain and seems crucial for complex thought. If an AI discovers these principles on its own, what does that really tell us about the path forward? Are we getting closer to models that don't just mimic output but actually learn more effective ways of how to think? Something to ponder?